My name is Lars Grigori. I'm working for SAP Custom Experience, so it's more the front-end part. SAP is known for the back-end part, doesn't matter. Um, I'm now since one week officially at the SAP CX Intelligence and Incubation team. My job is to do some research, look into new technologies, try to figure out what they are doing, and then the idea is to combine this with um, our custom experience um, products like commerce, m uh, marketing, doesn't matter. I don't want to sell here for the product, sorry. But to have an idea what the front end or custom experience is doing. In the old days, um, we did also some showcases, so for bigger events, um, yeah, doing some prototypes so the people can touch it or get a better understanding. And therefore, it's also one, one of the topics here is um, TinyML, where I looked into the sound getting... It's okay. Oh, it's okay, yeah. So I sometimes hear myself and not it doesn't matter. Sorry. So, yeah, look into what's possible with TinyML um, to run it on a device. And, yeah, this is the talk about. So I don't know if you know this movie. It's from the 90s, I think. And Steven Zelinsky is the guy, he invented something to shrink something and accidentally he shrunk his kids. And I, I don't know why I came up with this idea, but I think um, one day I, I went to my wife and said, look, I shrunk a uh, uh, machine learning model on this small device. I think this was some, some connection which I created in my head and therefore I thought, okay, it's a cool title to say. Honey, I shrunk the tiny ML. Um, the agenda. So, first of all, I will talk about the Raspberry Pi Pico. Then also TensorFlow Lite Micro, which connects machine learning model with the, yeah, with the Pico itself. And then I um, run on some Jupyter notebooks, different um, yeah, uh, notebooks wants to look into the size of the model, then the timing, what does it mean for this model, and also the accuracy. So, right. Let's start with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, it's from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, so it's, I think, if you know the Raspberry Pi, it's some, yeah, small computer. Linux is running on this one. This is a microcontroller, so there's no Linux on it. It's really a small, um, yeah, the black thing here in the middle. That's the heart of it, and it's an RP2040. So that's microcontroller. It's an 32-bit um, dual core Cortex, ARM Cortex M0 Plus. So this M0 is... Um, for low energy, this plus has something extra. And it's a microcontroller. 130, 100, 133, 130, 30 megahertz. So we are talking about megahertz, not gigahertz. So very slow, if you compare it nowadays. And also the yeah, embedded RAM or SRAM. 264 kilobyte. We are not talking about terabyte, kilo, mega, giga, kilo. So very small. And the reason I, I choose this one is, um, yeah, as you can see, it only costs four euro. So what do you get for four euro? Two liter Benz, uh, petrol, maybe. Yeah, and you have a device where machine learning can run on. So right. So that that's the idea. Um, that's the reason I, I selected it. The main reason was it's from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, so you can expect it will, be, it will exist at least five years or something. Okay, um, I have here some nice setup for the demo, and it looks a little bit better on uh, some when you create some some. A scheme out of this. So in the middle, you can see the Raspberry Pi Pico with lots of uh, pins. And all these pins, um, the green one, it's output, or you can have it as input output. You can program all this stuff. 
The black one and red one is for the power and yeah. But I only need um, one LED so to show if the buttons are pressed or not. So therefore two buttons also and that's the setup for, for this demo. And what will I do as a machine learning model? An exclusive OR. Totally simple one. Um, you absolutely don't need a machine learning model for this, so don't go out and say, oh, I have to do a machine, I can now do a machine learning model and throw out all if statements and use machine learning. No, it's just a simple model for this. And the cool thing about the exclusive OR is so. Zero, zero will be zero. If only one input signal is there, you have one. If you have two of them, then it's zero. And this makes it interesting for the machine learning model to, to train, because if you just think about you have one and zero, it will be one. You just can calculate it. But suddenly you have two ones, and it should be zero, which makes a little bit, just think about, complicated for the back propagation. Right, and um, yes, I will use a simple model, so it will not be accuracy, uh, accurate, totally. The reason for this, I need some, some strange values, they will always change also, but I can then see if I have the right button pressed. So that's, that's the idea here, just to make it clear. One second. because I'm getting sometimes the feedback, yeah, where's here the, the real um, scenario? I come here and want to learn something and have to do, will go home and, and have my own model. So one real scenario could be, for example, um, yeah, to detect if you are falling, like with the Apple Watch, to have some patterns and say, okay, I fall down and now I call the emergency service. I thought, okay, this would be a nice example, but um, Maybe I really fall down and then someone has to call the emergency. Um, yeah, other things. So normally the reason for, for um, running a machine learning model on of these devices is um, yeah, safety could be one thing. Uh, to, de to detect something if something is in the way or not on the correct uh, position and so on. Um, falling, uh, what else? Oh, I also um, read about something, um, so I think the NASA used this also to um, detect the walking pattern. So you have some device, you record your walking pattern, this will be uploaded in the model on the device and afterwards um, you, you can be identified because every one of us are walking different, so yeah, that's one of the, yeah. Just to say, there are also real um, scenarios here, and not this nice, simple X or model. And um, I will start with a simple model before I extend it and make it a little bit complicated. But this one is already um, oversized. So you can see you have two input values, some um, hidden layer, in this case eight nodes of them, and one output for detecting if the button is pressed or not, or if both are pressed. Okay, so why TinyML? So why, why is this so super cool and important and so on? So first of all, you don't need some internet connection. So if you want to detect something, it will be run on the device. Which is also good because no data leaves the device, so no big cloud provider gets your data, it stays on it. Then you also don't have some latency. So this is also some kind of argument to say, okay, I could send also the data with um, 5G to some provider, get super fast feedback, but you have still this, this small latency. So if you want to detect, for example, you, that the machine should stop immediately, it will be a bad idea if you have to wait two seconds for this before you get the result. And you may save also energy, which is very important nowadays. So, um, but this depends also um, how you set up your, your device and so on. So in this case, in this example, it runs in a while loop forever, 
which is not really um, energy efficient. So, but you can do it. So you could also take these things totally in, in sleep mode, wake it up, get some data, do the calculation with machine learning model on it, and then um, yeah, react on it, turn light on or off, and then um, sleep again. Um, yeah, I'm using TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Since the end of last year, they moved this out of the TensorFlow main core project in an own project, so it's uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro. So the difference is um, with the whole TensorFlow project, there's also the training um, is part of, of the machine learning model or of, of this project. For the microcontroller, um, you, don't, you don't train it on the microcontroller. So you pre-train the model on this machine here, on my local machine, or maybe in the cloud or somewhere, and then upload the model. So that's the way it works. And therefore, um, they need to re-implement also some functions um, for the microcontroller itself. Yeah. And therefore, there's an own project. Okay, let's start some Jupyter Notebook or open it up. Can you read it? Maybe a little bit bigger? Otherwise, I couldn't read it. And with glasses, it's a bit complicated to see. Um, yes, so here we have um, my first... Um, you bit the notebook, and I will just step through it. So here are some things you, you may install, uh, need to install. So this you bit the notebooks could also be running on uh, Google Colab, for example. Then you create the model, but in this case, you need to download the model and then um, add it to the project. When I run it locally, it will write the model file directly in my project. So that's the that's benefit of it. Um, yeah, importing some, some libraries, for example, TensorFlow. And oh yeah, I'm using Keras for, for this. Uh, the latest one is still working, which is always cool. And because it's a yeah, MacBook, a new one, it also has the GPU on it. It's also cool. Um, yeah, some, where well, I'm here, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's just some environment, otherwise some, some stupid error message will show up. So this one is the more important one with the model. So it's a sequential um, Keras model. I have eight hidden layers for this, two input layers, so for the two buttons itself. Um, using sigmoid as activation function, and then I have one output layer for the LED, also sigmoid on this, and that's it. And now I'm using binary cross entropy for the compilation part, and here are my, my super, um, yeah, super uh, data, training data, and also um, target data. Um, as you can see, Zero, zero will get zero, and also one, one gets zero, and otherwise one. So that's, that's all, all my training data I have to, to yeah, collect also. A 500 epochs, and now I just run it. As you can see, it takes a little bit, but not so long. And at one point, you get accuracy of yeah, 0 0.1. Because it, it could only be, be 0 0.1 at, at one point. It's, it's in this case, my test, my test data and real data are the same. So this is also not a real project. So in normally you, you get some have some test data and you end up at 80%, 90% if you're lucky, and so on. For this model, it's set up to, to have um, 100%. And now the interesting part is coming. My crazy numbers. So nearly zero, nearly one, nearly one, nearly zero. 
And if you're not tired enough, you can remember these numbers, because we will see it later on, which will be running on, on the device here. Otherwise, I jump back, don't worry. So you, you don't need to remember it. Or if someone wants to remember the number, can make a challenge out of this. No? Tired. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, this code here, the porting of, um, will take the model and convert it into C code in some kind of C code here. So um, where does it start? Pretty print replace, blah, blah, blah. Where's the part here? Unsigned jar and, and so on. So, um, so it takes the model, does a hex dump out of this, and then writes it down in a model um, C++ file. I will show it you later on. And um, for some reasons, um, there's this tiny ML gen library, which doesn't work anymore on this setup here. Old computer, it worked. Now uh, it doesn't work, so I just copied the, the function out of it. And so here is the, the port um, yeah, call takes the model, which was generated up, and then I write it directly into my project file as model CPP file, and that's it. OK. Done. Let's take a look into my code here. So here is my model CPP file some blah definition up front, if and else, and something great. And here I have my model data. So this is the model as hex dump. And it's just written out. Lots of code here. And in total, it's 1,848 bytes. So this is my model. Because it's TensorFlow light, there's also some definition for the TensorFlow stuff and so on. And somewhere between, there's also um, the weights and biases which um, for the hidden layers and so on. This is everything. It's inside. And now I can compile this. Just here, compile, compile, build or I can directly upload it in a debug mode. So here I have this setup. The first Raspberry Pi Pico, um, yeah. This is used as, as a kind of debugger. It gets the data and sends it to the second one. And because it only costs four euro, uh, so I have to pay eight euro to have this setup here. Otherwise, there's another possibility. You compile the, the file, and then you have to track it, drop it as um, kind of USB stick thing, so as a folder. But you have to press the key and unplug it, and it's totally complicated. And this one, it's easy. And I can also debug it, which you can see here. So it starts and stops at the main method. And let's step over it a little bit. So there's some things, um, input-output data initialization. And here I have the nice setup method. So the setup here is like at an Arduino. You have a setup part where you define um, all input and output data and also the TensorFlow uh, model. And then in a while loop, so you have the while true forever, it, the loop function will be called. And this is where um, the data is sent to the model, and result comes back. And if, if it's one or nearly one, then um, the light turns on, otherwise not. I jump into it. So this is for setting the input and output pin for my buttons and for the LED. And here is the interesting part with the model itself. For TensorFlow, where do I get it? Here. So this one, 
is my model data, which is in the model CPP file. So all these hex numbers are getting, um, yeah, will be read here, and then I have a model, and now I can run on this model my machine learning. This is not so interesting, blah, 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 the more interesting. I get an interpreter out of this, and yeah, more stuff you have. This one is the interesting part. So with this imprinter, I have an input and an output. And so I define this as some global variables here. And if I scroll down in the loop file, line 92 and 93, reading the button status, and then I set this data into the input field as float number. That's the reason with the F. So one input is button one, the other one button two. And then I get the status out of this, and here I have the data, the output data. And yeah, I have an if statement here, so this is... I need an if statement anyway, so as I said, this model is just for, as an example, to see what, 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 what can I do with it, with the size and so on. And if the value is greater than, um, yeah, 0 0.5, I turn on the LED, otherwise I turn it off. And now I can run it, and if I press here the button, you can say it's working. Prove it, and now I press two buttons, and perfect, yeah. <laughs> and now who remembered some number? Here we have the numbers. So let's take a look. The first one was 0032. As you can see, 0032. Now I press this button and I get 90, 40, 36. So this is 90, 40. Ah, here this one, yeah. This one should be the other button. Yes, and both buttons are 0, 7, 5. So now I know I have the correct model on this device and not something um, which was yesterday or something. So, okay. Good. Now I'm done. Have a nice evening. No. <laughs> um, now it gets get more interesting. Let's take a look. What can I do with this model? Because it's a super cool model. So I just run it. Because it's nearly the same code. I have some, some special part here which yeah, transfers this value and also with some um, optimization and so on. I will get into this later. Um, it's the same model. And as you can see, now we have different numbers. Because every time, yeah, it's initialized with random numbers and therefore you get uh, some, some different results out of this. And the only difference between this model and the other one is I have here the possibility to define uh, two layers. So in this example, I still have eight for the first um, hidden layer and zero for the second. So no, it's only one layer at the moment. Yeah, and if I get a second one, I add this one here. So if there's an other number and so on. And the one thing I want to show now is like, okay, what happens if I change this one to three? And just run it again. And meanwhile, it should show something up in two. Takes a little bit. So what's the difference between these two? I have here the tensor board. So the orange one here is nice, nice example. <laughs> no.
no. <laughs> that's, that's nice when you have this example. And let's take a look here. How should it normally look like? This would be normally a little bit the difference. So the orange one was the one with eight um, input hidden layers. The blue one is with three. This means um, it takes a little bit more time before it reaches um, 100%. Because with the eight, the backpropagation has more possibilities to change something, and with three, it changes one, and this influences also the other one, and therefore it have to try it again, and so on. So that's that's the different. Nice, I have this screenshot. Because no, it's normally always the same, but then you show a demo and it's just like maybe, luckily it's not the opposite. So in this case, um, yeah. Totally, nearly the same, yeah. Cool. Okay, so what's also the difference is like, um, I take a look here, no. I have here the models. Which one is it here? I have the example. So, oh, I don't know if I can scroll this. I read it. Uh, maybe someone else needs to read it. Um, so, I have three, uh, four files now. The one with the eight is with the i8 input layer or hidden layers, and the three with three, and with the f it's um, optim not optimized, and with the t it's an optimized model. And the difference can is there some difference only between? Yeah, okay. No. So the not optimized. The eight hidden layers not optimized is around to, uh, 12 kilobyte. With three, it's reduced, in this case, 11 uh, kilobyte, but it's, I didn't wrote it down. It's um, eight times, two times, 10, to four, to four byte, um, yeah, something 800 kilobyte or something, maybe, or 500. And um, then I have also here this optimized. So um, when I transfer this, this model in my nice function here, which I also copied again, I can, um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, here, here, here. This is somewhere here I can optimize the model or not. And if you compare it one more time, um, so the optimized model is bigger than the not optimized model. And this makes no sense. Except if you try to think about to optimize the model, you need to add also some extra functionality into this model. And because it's only um, yeah, eight or um, three um, nodes, inside of it, and the, the amount of, of the bytes are totally small, this extra thing uh, makes it bigger than, than yeah, smaller in the other way. So therefore, um, did I forget something? No. Therefore, I need a model which is big, and then the optimization should work, or makes more sense. OK, and therefore, I just at here, which number 16, and 128. So this makes absolutely no sense for this model. It makes just big, huge. It will still have some strange values. It will not get to zero. Um, it takes um, some extra epoch, so um, in case the second layer is here, I um, yeah, add 1,024 epochs, otherwise it will not find a result, maybe. 
and as you can see, it's still running. So in this case, it took 24 seconds. The other one was 9, 8 seconds, something like this. The result is, yeah, a little bit more to 0 and 1, but there's no result on, on this. So it absolutely makes no sense for this model to have a second layer and, and six, 16 and 128, but um, I get a huge model and can demonstrate now how long it will take. Yes. For the calculation. So just one thing here. So I have one, uh, this is the, the result from the machine learning model, and the other uh, uh, number here are some microseconds or something. So it's fast on, on this way. And it's around 200 just to remember. And when I now change this model here in my make list, so this is a CMake file um, where I define my model and it's 16 and I'm using not optimized, yes. Save it, stop the other one and upload it, and now I forgot to write down a joke, because it's always say, take some time, and what should I talk now? And I thought I'd write down a joke and read it down, but yes. Um, okay, so in this file I just can configure which model I'm using, and um, with the second uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, note, Jupyter Notebook, I just create the files and add them inside of it. And now I can just run it directly because the initialized part and so on is the same. And as you can see, it's now about 5,000. So it's some factor, 25, is it 25? It's late, I think so. So it takes more time because the calculation itself has now um, yeah, 16 and 128. Yeah. So, yeah, mod, mod calculation. At the end, the result is not, not so important. And, um, oh yeah, it's still working. You can prove it? Okay, I heard a yes. <laughs> right. So, the other side is also, um, let's take the optimized model. Uh, where I have it, here I have it. So I use the T here, save it, otherwise it will not work maybe. No. Upload it here. And in the meanwhile, I can take a look here, right. So, um, This huge, nice supermodel now has a size not optimized uh, of 72 kilobyte. So it's totally um, yeah, blown up. And the optimized model, now, wait a second, or I just run it and then I come back. Um, only 36, is it 36? Yes, 36, so half of the size. So now the optimization is working. And the difference is but also it takes longer now. So the timing, yeah. And the reason for this, it's simple. Let's take a look, open one of these models. So I can now, this is Natron. You upload some TensorFlow light model on this. And I upload first of all the one which is not optimized, and the second one which is optimized. And the difference, can I make it bigger? Yes. So let's start here. 
Okay, why is this white and this one um, dark? Um, yeah, because the, uh, the white one is optimized and the not... Don't know. Nice. It doesn't matter. I think you, you can read it. And the difference, the difference is when I go here inside of the weights, I've got... Here. No. Why this one, not this one? Input, buyer, no. Ah, the connected, this one, makes more sense. Yes. So, these are the weights for the not optimized model. And as you can see, there are lots of float numbers. You don't have to remember them, that's just... Oh, maybe you can remember and then calculate if it's, if it's nearly the same. So... And here we have um, the same for the optimized model. And as you can see, it's only integer numbers. And a float number needs four bytes, an integer only one byte. And to get this number, this minus 35, is multiplied with this quantization factor. So this zero point something here is multiplied with, let's multiply it with zero five, uh, to some, that, add some brackets. And I will get minus five, six, one, something like this. And if you look here, I have here minus five, six, seven. So with this um, yeah, quantization and so on, you get, of course, some, some... It's not accurate anymore. So it will... The, it's not the same number as, as before. If you sum up all this calculation, then you get a different result. Oh, I can prove it also. So now I have here 0, um, 11. And if I take a look into my crazy numbers here, it's 0 0.12. So this is the original number before the optimization was 0 0.12. And now I get 0 0.11 because, yeah, with this factor, you, you get lose some data on it but the size is um, smaller. So instead of 72 kilobyte, you only have 36 kilobyte. Right. And, but the other way around, it takes longer for the calculation because now every number is calculated, multiplied with the factor. So, makes sense. Or does someone think I have a failure here? No. Just curiosity. So, uh, does the price have a float capability? So, the, the actual software uses justice for uh, some certain purposes. Have we used just uh, uh, operation actually stands in the future? Uh, yes, right. So, the, the question is if. Uh, yeah, I, I know it. I, so, I have to repeat the, uh, the question. The question is if. The Raspberry Pi Pico has some floating capabilities? I think not. So there's some, some in the TensorFlow, um, but I'm not sure. I looked into it, but I couldn't found, find something on it. So answers this question, no. But so this is smaller but slow? Small and slow, yes. So comment was small but slow, and I say yes. <laughs> right. Okay, how much time do I have? Yeah, some, some... Let's try something crazy. No, I don't have to do it crazy, it's, it's fine. Um, one thing I could also now demonstrate is like um, when I change the second layer to 256 nodes, which absolutely makes no sense, it will not get better than this model. But the problem is um, this model will not run on the Pico um, not optimized, so the unoptimized version is too big, doesn't, will, will not run. Um, the optimized version, I could also use 512. It takes longer, of course, and, and so on, but it's still possible to have a smaller size of the model itself, which could run on, on the model, yeah. That's it, I think I forgot nothing. Nice, I have this one, happy. 
Nice demo, yeah. So, Visual Studio, right. So, so to sum it up, yeah. Size depends on the model itself. Um, also, the bigger the model is, the more timing you need for it. And with the optimization, the accuracy yeah, will be lower. But depends on the size, it will be smaller. So you can run it on a small device. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Are there questions? I check it just a chat. Oh, did I get it right? The first Pico is for programming the second one. Yes, that's right. So the first Pico um, I have here um, programs the second one. So this is just some, some kind of programming device. You also get this for an STM microcontroller where you just connect it and then can program it. it. Um, you can also use a Raspberry Pi, a real Raspberry Pi for this. There's some setup for it. But um, yeah, the Pico itself costs four dollars so, or four euro. Super easy, simple device. Yeah. Um, question is if the um, on the micro if there's the same um, operation codes like on the um, core one. Um, not every every operation is there, so that's that's the reason they have to re-implement it and so on. So um, sometimes they of course they are behind, and they also have the restriction with the yeah microcontroller model or architecture itself. So LSTM, for example, I think it's now possible. Half a year ago, it wasn't possible to run an LSTM on it. So there's, there's some kind of, of restrictions, because they have to re-implement the, the code also in C again. And yeah, they handle lots of, of microcontrollers, so there's also some specialization for each microcontroller itself. Other question? Some water. The question is, um, yeah, the code is converted to a C code, and if um, I could run it in micro with MicroPython, I think it's possible to run um, MicroPython on, on the Raspberry Pi Pico itself as some kind of interpreter where you upload the code or something. Uh, but I didn't try it. I'm not sure 100% if this r will work on, on a Pico itself. But there are some microcontrollers where you have the MicroPython. Oh, the question is like, um, I make it smaller or even bigger sometimes, and I want, how can I make it faster? Yeah, the thing was like uh, from eight to three, it was faster also. So, but at one point you, you have, I couldn't use one, one um, node for the hidden layer. I think three is the minimum on it. So, is there something, no? Not sure if it could be faster on this way. Maybe more energy efficient. Yeah, this word, sustainable. It's a better word. Um, instead of running it in a for loop, just call the model when some changes on the buttons happen. So just to check if if button has changed, maybe with some interrupt thing, and then call the model. So this would be for make all this thing a little bit more sustainable. Right now it just runs and calculates, and as you can see here, uh, it produces always some output. Okay, yep, another question. Okay. The 
The question is if we are using it in our company as a real um, scenario. Um, not right now or at, at this point because of Corona, we don't have any showcases and so on. So this, therefore, no for, for the Raspberry Pi Pico. What we once did was with a TensorFlow coral board with some kind of um, smart mirror as a showcase where you could also train the model on the TensorFlow Coral with the Raspberry Pi, with the real Raspberry Pi. So in this case, you, you set up some um, glasses and then train the model for these glasses. And if someone else comes and takes on the glasses, then it would be identified, OK, this is class number two or the green one, and so on. So one use case could be, for example, to try to run um, the same scenario with a trained model already with the Raspberry Pi Pico and some kind of camera, but I think it's a little bit, um, therefore the Raspberry Pi Pico is too small, in my opinion. Or the camera should be more um, black and white or something, a low resolution. Yeah. Um, when you're in your house, so you can actually take a picture, run the whole uh, run the image you, you yep. took through a, through a tensile flow uh, neural network. You extract uh, you know, the current number and set it off to this report. Right. Is the model running on the ESP? Yes, OK. So this is also possible. So the comment was there's an ESP camera 32. 32 it, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, yeah. ESP 32, it's a bigger one than the, the old ESPs, right? And there's, with the camera, you can um, leverage the water um, filling. And it's also running the model on the TensorFlow. Or, or no, the TensorFlow model on the ESP. Right, and it only costs six bucks. So I'm talking to the audience. <laughs> oh, there's another question, sorry. Can you share your repo? Um, yes, it's on GitHub and it's on the slide. So this, this slide you can see here, it's, it's the repo itself. And I will update it because this has TensorFlow 2.6, the actual one. Um, and with the new MacBook, it doesn't work anymore, so I have to upgrade it, and I will do it today, tomorrow. Any questions? It's nice I see myself here. I thought still behind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, any other question? Oh, okay, cool. Thank you.